All right, good morning, everybody. Good to see you all this morning on a beautiful, beautiful day here in Nebraska. So it's great to uh, be together to worship the Lord. I invite you to come on in, find a seat, and we will get started. Welcome to those who are also joining us today online. Glad to have you with us as well. We are in Acts chapter 12 this morning, finishing up Acts chapter 12 and moving into chapter 13. And I want to give a special thank you to uh, the guys in the back. So Paul and Tony and Roger, appreciate that because uh, I sent them this PowerPoint this morning just after 8 o'clock, uh, hoping and praying that they would be on top of their email <laughs> and able to load this up. So thanks, guys. I appreciate it greatly because uh, uh, I would be standing up here for a long time with nothing to say if, I, if this PowerPoint wasn't working. <clears throat> so we're going to be referencing a lot of geography today uh, and going forward. We also have some things to talk about as far as the Herods of the New Testament, and so put together a little PowerPoint. Now, we've talked a little bit about this previously. Keep in mind that the uh, book of Acts is a book of transitions. Uh, it's a book of transitions in many different ways. There are geographic transitions, uh, and Jesus first talked about that when he reminded his followers that they were going to be his witnesses both in Jerusalem and then in Judea and Samaria and ultimately to the uttermost parts of the earth, which also includes Nebraska, uh, by the way. Uh, and so it ultimately was his plan to have the church continue to grow and expand. And so the book of Acts is all about those kind, that kinds of growth, transition, or movement. But as I've mentioned before, and the other guys have mentioned as well, there's other movements that are taking place in this uh, amazing letter. You, you see this transition, this growth that takes place from Jewish believers to the Gentile believers, and we're going to see more and more of that in the coming days. We also see this change in focus from the early church in Jerusalem with the Twelve, uh, and again, Judas had killed himself, replaced by Matthias, so it's still the Twelve that they're called, and this change from the Twelve to much more of a focus, as we're going to see going forward, uh, on this one uh, previous persecutor of the church, now convert, named Saul, who eventually will be called Paul, as we'll see as we get later on. But so far, he's kind of a side character a little bit, other than the persecution that he caused and the movement that, uh, that uh, was brought about because of that. You may not like geography. That's okay. You don't necessarily have to like geography. But when it comes to a book like the book of Acts, which again is the Acts of the Apostles, but you could also call it the Acts of Jesus Christ or the Acts of the Holy Spirit as he's moving his church, geography is going to get more and more important. You just need to pay attention to it so that you can appreciate, again, the movement that takes place. And I always encourage people who uh, you know, love their local church and they're involved here, think local geography as well. Uh, how cool is it when churches have an opportunity to plant other churches in other real physical locations? Uh, and uh, we might even get so bold to send missionaries into Iowa, ooh, you know, uh, and, so, and something like that, and they go into other places and other regions, and you learn to understand some of that geography and some of what is being talked about. So we're going to look at this map just for a second as kind of an introduction to remind you of some of the geographic movement that has been taking place just since chapter 8 of the book of Acts. So previous to that, the focus was really on Jerusalem and all these different activities that were taking place in Jerusalem. But beginning in Acts chapter 8, this persecution breaks out against the church. And because of that persecution, the church is then scattered. And eventually what you see them do is, uh, let's see, you can see my line here. Oops, don't be going that way. All right. Um, let's see if I can push the right button at the right time. Um, so obviously we're here in Jerusalem. Um, and the persecution begins to take place, and people begin to scatter in all different directions. And they don't go too very far in chapter 8, just into the areas of Samaria, uh, and the Samaritans hear the gospel, and then we have the story of the Ethiopian eunuch. And again, remember, he's on the road to Gaza, uh, and Gaza is still the Gaza that we hear about in the news today, same general location. And so on that road, he meets this Ethiopian and shares the gospel with him. And so the gospel is in the process of spreading. We get into Acts chapter 9, and Paul is going from Jerusalem to Damascus. 
because he knows that believers are being scattered around and he wants to go to, to, to Damascus to see if there are any there and to ultimately arrest them. And by the mercy and the grace of God, Jesus reveals himself to Paul on the road to Damascus. He becomes a believer. He does a, a lot of traveling around, uh, especially heads over into the desert for a while, comes back to Damascus, but eventually he heads back home to his hometown of Tarsus. And this is important as well. So Tarsus is way up here to the north. And it's a reminder to us of the unique person that Paul is because Paul grew up as a Jew in Gentile territory. So he was familiar with the customs and the cultures of Gentiles. He probably had some Gentile friends when he was growing up. Uh, until he learned that, no, you're a Jew, you don't associate with those dogs, uh, and so you just leave those people alone. Uh, but, but he probably would have had some concern, some awareness of Gentiles. And eventually then, as I said, he goes home. Well, we find in chapter 10, the gospel now going to the Gentiles. And quick question, who is the apostle that first shares the gospel with a Gentile in his Gentile house? Peter, very good. That's critical to remember. Peter is the one first who goes. And we see the story of him leaving Jerusalem. He goes over to Joppa on the coast. And eventually there in Joppa, he has those three men come and visit him from Caesarea and asks Peter to come and share the gospel with them up in Caesarea. And it's in Caesarea where Cornelius and his family are the ones who ultimately hear the gospel. Uh, and Peter's almost in the middle of his message, talking about the role of Jesus and the fact that Jesus is now King of kings and Lord of lords. And while he's speaking to them, the these uh, Gentiles believe and the Holy Spirit falls upon them. Uh, and Peter realizes, wow, uh, they received the same gift just like we did in Jerusalem originally when the Holy Spirit came upon us. How could we not have them baptized as true followers of Christ? And he baptizes them uh, in Caesarea there in chapter 10. We get into the first part of chapter 11, and Peter returns back to Jerusalem from, God, from Caesarea, back to home church, if you will, and he's challenged by some of the Jewish believers that are there. How could you associate with a Gentile? How could you go do that? And then Peter retells them the story about the mercy and the grace of Christ that was going to these Gentiles as he simply shared the gospel with them, and they believed just like we did. We believed, and the Holy Spirit came upon us. They believed, and the Holy Spirit came upon them. They're fellow Christians in this united, unified church that God is in the process of building. And so finally, even the Jewish believers rejoice in what the gospel is doing. And in the latter half of chapter 11, we see the gospel then continue to spread, and it talks about the fact that as these Christians are being scattered, eventually they make their way all the way up here north in Syria to the city of Antioch. And uh, at that point in time, the Jewish believers were still pretty much just comfortable with sharing, were the Jews from Jerusalem, sharing with other Jews. But the Jews who happened to grow up into foreign lands, they mentioned Cyprus, they mentioned the city of Cyrene, that Jews from those areas, as they traveled to Antioch, they're willing to share with the Gentiles. And so they start sharing the gospel with the Gentiles in Antioch. And the hand of the Lord is with them and blesses them. And multitudes of Gentiles are coming to know Christ. This is amazing. And the word gets back to Jerusalem. And again, the Jewish believers there in Jerusalem are a little unsure about what in the world is happening out there in Gentile land. And so they send one of their faithful servants, Barnabas, from Jerusalem up to Antioch to kind of find out what's going on. And Barnabas is a man full of faith and wisdom, and he sees the hand and the mercy of God being extended to these Gentiles who truly are trusting in Christ, and he rejoices with them. And he says, this is great, this is fantastic. In fact, we need to continue to do this and do it even more and even better, and I need a friend. And I know a guy who's a really good teacher, and he just happens to be over here in the city of Tarsus. And so he heads over to Tarsus to look for Saul. He finds Saul. He brings him back to Antioch. And for a, over a year, they hang out there in Antioch, teaching the word of God and seeing all kinds of people come to know Christ. Things are going great. But at the end of chapter 11, because of a famine that occurs, the believers up here in Antioch decide that we want to send a gift to the believers down in Jerusalem. And so they end up sending that money 
in the hands of Barnabas and Saul. And so they go back down to Jerusalem, and that's kind of where we end, cha- excuse me, end chapter 11. Well, chapter 12, we started last week, and chapter 12 begins with opposition from Herod, who brings about the death of James, the brother of John. Yes, one of the sons of thunder was the very first one uh, of the 12 to be killed, and he arrests Peter, and Aaron taught about that last week. We're going to review it very briefly this morning uh, as we get into the details. So let me pray, and then we'll look at the rest of chapter 12. Father God, we do come before you this morning, and again, just thank you for your mercy and for your grace. We thank you for your faithfulness, not just in building the church in the first generation, and we're so excited to see this work happen, but Lord Jesus, you are still in charge of your church today. Holy Spirit, you are still building your church today as your gospel goes forth, as the the clarity of what Christ accomplished on the cross is proclaimed. People believe it, and people repent and turn from their sin, and they put their faith and their trust in what Jesus accomplished for them, and we become members of this same church, the same great universal body of Christ. And so, Father, we rejoice in that fact. So as we're reading this history, encourage us for today, that we would share the gospel today, that we would talk to people today about Jesus, knowing that you are still in charge and that you are still building your church. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, Acts chapter 12. Again, the text this morning, we're just looking at the uh, officially the last few verses of chapter 12 and the first three verses of chapter 13, so it's a short enough section that it gives me some time that we can focus a little bit on King Herod that is mentioned here uh, in this section. And so what I put together for us this morning is, uh, we cut cut off the top little piece, that's okay, but uh, this is Herod's family tree, and so we're going to learn a little bit about Herod and his family tree mainly because there are at least five different Herods mentioned in the New Testament, and it's five different people. It's really, really easy to miss the fact that they are different individuals, but they're all related to one another. So we're going to take a few minutes real quick and go through this and uh, look at some of the scriptures. So the very first one, Grandpa, if you will, is Herod the Great. Herod the Great, as it says here, uh, ruled from the years 37 to 4 B.C. So all of this, again, B.C. This is the Herod that was alive when Jesus is born. He's the Herod that's talked about early on. Uh, He's the one who tried to trick the wise men and, and ended up killing the male babies that are in Bethlehem. Very powerful client king. Uh, And because of his rule and dynasty and then uh, his children, uh, they oversaw several generations here of rule in the general area of Palestine. Open your Bibles, if you would. We're going to read these verses real quick so that hopefully in the future, as you're reading these, you don't get confused and you remember kind of who's who when it comes to the the house of Herod. So Matthew chapter 2, verses 1 to 3, says this. Now, after Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea in the days of Herod the king, that is Herod the Great, Herod the king, Magi from the east arrived in Jerusalem, saying, Where is he who is born king of the Jews? For we saw his star in the east, and we have come to worship him. And when Herod the king, Herod the Great, heard this, he was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. He was troubled because he was not excited to see the Messiah come. He thought it was competition. Uh, And that was his chief concern. Look down to verse 7 and 8. When Herod, here Herod the the Great, when Herod secretly called the Magi and determined from them the exact time the star appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem, and he said, Go and search carefully for the child, and when you have found him, report to me, so that I too may come and worship him. What a snake. You know, I want to worship him too. (laughs) Ah! I want to kill him is what I ultimately want to do. And it's because of the fact that he found out when the star first appeared that when he does go have to kill the male children, it's why he picks two years and younger because that's the time when the star had appeared. It had been two years prior, and then he has all of those babies executed. Verses 13 to 15. Now when they had gone, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream. So the Magi now have left. This angel appears to Joseph in a dream and tells him, Get up, take the child and his mother, and flee to Egypt, and remain there until I tell you. For Herod is going to search for the child to destroy him. 
And so Joseph got up and took the child with his mother uh, while it was still night and left for Egypt. So flees immediately and remained there until the death of Herod, the Herod the Great. Notice this. Please, please notice this. And you're going to see it every time in Matthew. Matthew then adds, This was to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Out of Egypt I called my son. Matthew especially is great at showing all of these historical details, but then reminding us this was according to God's plan. This was according to what God had foretold in the Old Testament. Herod thinks he's in control. Herod's a pawn, accomplishing the things that God wants and uses him for those purposes. All right, so that's Herod the Great. <coughs> Grandpa, if you will, up here again at the top. Now we're going to talk about some of his immediate descendants or sons. And four different ones of his sons are mentioned in the New Testament. They all bear the name Herod something, or, or describes as Herod's. It's more of a family name, if you will, so don't get confused by them. Going left to right, the first one we're going to talk about briefly is Herod uh, Archelaus. Oops, sorry. Um, calm down. Oops. Okay. Herod Archelaus ruled from again when his father died, 4 B.C., just to 6 A.D. He's a, he's a, uh, he's a uh, harsh ruler, again, as it says here, received one half of his father's territory when his father had passed away, specifically the area surrounding and near Jerusalem. So Judea and Samaria was his, Herod Archelaus. But the Romans didn't like him after a while for a variety of reasons, and so they eventually, because again, Jerusalem was in his territory, they replace him, and instead of having another one of Herod's descendants, they put in a Roman um, proculator, and eventually that position is held by Pontius Pilate. Okay? So that's why this guy ends his reign fairly early, 6 AD. Joseph, after the, the death of Herod, is unwilling to go back to Bethlehem because of that, and then ultimately goes to Galilee. So notice, again, Matthew chapter 2, going on, verse 19 to 23, says this, But when Herod died, Herod the Great died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt. And he said to him, Get up, take the child and his mother, and go back into the land of Israel. For those who sought the child's life are dead. So Joseph got up, took the child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. Verse 22, but when he heard that Archelaus, this is now Herod Archelaus, the son of Herod the Great, was reigning over Judea in place of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there. Then, after being warned by God in a dream, that's critical, warned by God in a dream, he left for the regions of Galilee. And he came and lived in a city called Nazareth. Notice again, this was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophets. He will be called a Nazarene. Who's in control? God's in control. God's working out all the details for his honor and glory. That's Archelaus, where you see several other brothers that are here. Uh, number one, he liked the name Philip. You know, I like the name Philip too, but hey, this is kind of crazy because uh, he names two of his sons Philip. The first one, the older one, Herod Philip, ultimately he kills. His father executes him, uh, but, you know, and then has another Philip to replace him later on. Great guy. But uh, before he kills him, Herod has a wife, Herodias, who uh, we're going to learn a little bit more about in a minute. So that's the Philip whose wife Herodias belongs to at the time. Uh, and ultimately then she goes over to Herod Antipas, and he's one that's uh, known more in the Scripture. We only know the older Philip simply because of the fact that uh, he's one of the sons who's married to Herodias. So Herod Antipas ruled from, again, 4 B.C. when his father passes away until 39 A.D. Remember, the other one was only about 6 A.D. And then the Romans established a Roman procurator over Jerusalem and Judea. Here, it's in a different territory. So he received about a quarter of his father's territory, which included Galilee and Perea. So Galilee, where Nazareth is, this is the Herod that's ruling over that area. Again, as I mentioned, after 6 AD, Judea was overseen by this Roman procurator. Goes on, King Herod during, uh, was the king. He's the Herod that we see in the New Testament during the ministry, the trial, and the crucifixion of Jesus. He's the one who married uh, Herodias, the wife 
of his older brother Philip, and because of that, John the Baptist criticizes him publicly. John is arrested and ultimately uh, beheaded because of that. This is the Herod now, one of the sons of Herod the Great, Herod Antipas, who's uh, ruling during the, uh, again, life and ministry, or the, yeah, the, the ministry and crucifixion of Jesus. So turn over to Mark chapter 6. Mark chapter 6, and notice verses 17 to 22. If you're not careful, when you read all these different things out of the Gospels, you see Herod, and you think it's the same person. It's not. This is, this is now Herod Antipas. So Mark 6, verse 17. For Herod himself had sent and had John arrested. This actually in the situation where Mark is, is kind of talking about a past event um, to what was going on in this particular chapter. Herod himself had sent and had John arrested and bound in prison on account of Herodias, the wife of his brother Philip, because he had married her. For John had been saying to Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife, because Philip was still alive at the time. Herodias had a grudge against him, wanted to put him to death and could not do so, for Herod was afraid of John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he kept him safe. And when he heard him, he was always very perplexed, for he used to enjoy listening to him. A strategic day came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his lords and military commanders and the leading men of Galilee. And when the daughter of Herodias her, herself came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his dinner guests. And the king said to the girl, we'll talk about her in a second, ask me for whatever you want and I will give it to you. This strange, ungodly man and his passions. Uh, his passions got him in trouble numerous times. But he found it interesting to listen to John the Baptist. One of the themes that we'll see with several of these Herods is they were so close to the truth. They heard truth. They thought sometimes the truth was interesting. But they didn't act on it. That's the key. They didn't act on that truth. Thinking the scripture is interesting and believing it, trusting it, are two totally different things. We'll talk more about that in a minute. Turn over to Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, now a little bit more of the trial of Jesus, and we see the role that, Luke, that um, this Herod, Herod Antipas, plays. Chapter 23, verses 1 to 12. This is talking about the Sanhedrin now during the trial of Jesus. Then the whole body of them got up and brought him before Pilate, and they began to accuse him, saying, We found this man misleading our nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar and saying that he himself is Christ, a king. And so Pilate, the Roman Pilate, asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? And he said to him, It is as you say. And then Pilate said to the chief priests and to the crowds, I find no guilt in this man. But they kept on insisting, saying, well, he stirs up the people, teaching all over Judea, starting from Galilee, even from as far as this place. Remember, the Roman procurators over Judea, not Galilee. And when he hears that Jesus is ultimately from Galilee, ah, this is good. I'm going to kind of pass the buck. I'm going to send this guy over to Herod and see what Herod has to say. Verse 6, when Pilate heard it, he asked whether the man was a Galilean. And when he learned that he belonged to Herod's jurisdiction, he sent him to Herod, who himself also was in Jerusalem at that time. Verse 8, now Herod was very glad, same Herod who had had John beheaded. Herod was very glad when he saw Jesus, for he had wanted to see him for a long time because he'd been hearing about him and was hoping to see some sign performed by him. Ooh, do a miracle. This is fun. I'm not going to believe, but still, I want to see this supernatural, cool stuff happen. He questioned him for a long time, and he answered him. Jesus answered him nothing. And the chief priests and the scribes were standing there accusing him, him vehemently. And Herod, with his soldiers, after treating him with contempt and mocking him, dressed him in a gorgeous robe and sent him back to Pilate, back to Pilate to be executed. And when Herod and, uh, now Herod and Pilate became friends with one another that very day, for before they had been enemies with each other. Hmm. The enemy of my enemy now has become my friend. Yeah. Um, and they seem to have something, at least, in common at that point, where that's Herod Antipas, but he's not the last Herod. And again, we talked about Herodias, uh, the wife of Philip, coming over here. 
But Herodias and Philip had a daughter, Salome, and she's the one that had danced in front of her. And so what a weird family where your daughter-in-law is now dancing and pleasing her father-in-law, who also happens to be her uncle, uh, because again, uh, she's the daughter of his brother. uh, And then eventually Salome becomes the wife of the other Philip, who is also her uncle as well. So Philip the Tetrarch, uh, who is mentioned in history, uh, but just casually mentioned in the New Testament. Well, we've got two more Herods very briefly to talk about, but they're all related to another of the sons of Herod the Great. And so they're a grandson and a great-grandson, but not through any of the Herods that have power in the New Testament. He rules over a different area, um, Aristobulus, and ultimately his son then is Herod Agrippa I. Herod Agrippa I. This is the dude we're dealing with in chapter 12, okay? So this is the Herod we're talking about today. Ruled from 37 to 44 AD, he received the quarter of the territory that his father had received when his father passed away. It's passed on to him. His territory eventually is expanded, though, because he's a good, ruthless ruler, and he eventually does take over Judea in the year 41. King Herod Uh, This King Herod uh, is the king during the early years of the church. He's the one here who arrests Peter, has James, the brother of John, killed. We're going to read those verses now. So back to chapter 12, Acts chapter 12. And this is our introductory reading then for today. Acts chapter 12. Starting with chapter, verse 1 says the following. Now about that time, Herod the king, not Herod the great, not Herod Antipas, different Herod now from a different part of the line, but now one of the grandsons of Herod the great. Now about that time, Herod the king laid hands on some who belonged to the church in order to mistreat them. And he had James, the brother of John, put to death with a sword. And when he saw that it pleased the Jews, he proceeded to arrest Peter also. And now it was during the days of unleavened bread. Remember, unleavened bread was the feast right around Passover. Okay, So this is the annual celebration now, as far as the church is concerned, of the death and the resurrection now of Jesus, all of this taking place. Verse 4, when he had seized him, when Herod had seized him, he put him in prison, delivering him to four squads of soldiers. Remember that as we go through this story. Four squads, we're not told how big the squads are, but four squads of soldiers to guard him, intending that after the Passover to bring him out before the people. And so Peter was kept in prison, but prayer for him was being fervently offered by the church to God. And on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, Peter was sleeping, content, trusting in the Lord, sleeping, between two soldiers bound with two chains and guards in front of the door were watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell. And he struck Peter, poked him uh, in his side and woke him up. And he said, get up quickly. And his chains, chains simply fell off his hands. And the angel said to him, gird yourself. Come on, put your coat on, Uh, put on your sandals. And he did so. And he said to him, wrap your cloak around you and follow me. And he went out and continued to follow, and he did not know that what was being done by the angel was real. He thought he was seeing a vision, because how does this happen? The chains just fall off, I just walk out, no one seems to notice what's going on. Verse 10, when they had passed the first and the second guard, they came to the iron gate that leads into the city, which opened for them by itself, and they went out. And they went along one street, and immediately the angel just, poof, departed from him. And then Peter came to himself and said, poof. Now I know for sure that the Lord has sent his angel and rescued me from the hand of Herod, Herod uh, Agrippa I, Herod, and from the Jewish people uh, from what they were expecting. And when he had realized this, he went to the house of Mary. Notice this, because this is going to play a role too in what we'll see later in this chapter. He went to the house of Mary, the mother of John, who was also called Mark. This house that he goes to, the, 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 the owner of the house is Mary, the mother of John, also called Mark, where many others were gathered. 
And then the story goes on. This is when he knocks at the door. Rhoda comes, recognizes his voice, leaves him standing outside, you know, where he can still get picked up by, you know, some, you know, Roman who happened to be walking by. Uh, anyway, the rest of the story goes on, um, and then we're going to pick it up with uh, the verses that we'll see this morning. So that is the Herod that we'll be talking about, or this is the Herod we'll be talking about this morning. One other one that we want to mention is his son, Agrippa II, because he too shows up in the book of Acts. And if you're not careful, you think, oh, same Herod, same guy who's been here forever. No, nope, this is his son now. This is Agrippa II, ruled from sometime in the 50s, because as we're going to see, his father has an untimely death. Uh, and he's evidently not old enough to take over yet. And so others rule in his stead until he's old enough to take over sometime in the 50s. And he rules until after the Jewish war and the Romans destroyed Jerusalem in A.D. 70. So a fairly lengthy rule. This is the King Herod, Ag Agrippa II. He's the king during the later years of the church and during Paul's later ministry. Paul eventually presents the gospel before him when he appears uh, appeals to Caesar. And we see that at the end of the book of Acts. So turn over to chapter 25 real quick. We'll read those verses. And uh, we will remind you when we get to chapter 25 that, yep, this is Herod, but not the same Herod who died because obviously he died. So this is somebody else. This is Herod Agrippa II that we're going to see here in chapter 25. Pick it up in verse 13. Again, great story here for Paul and his uh, appearance before uh, these religious leaders as he ultimately is going to appeal to Caesar. Verse 13, Now when several days had elapsed, King Agrippa, Herod Agrippa, and Bernice arrived at Caesarea and paid their respects to Festus. Festus now is the Roman procurator who's over this whole area who had replaced Pontius Pilate sometime down the road. Verse 14, While they were spending many days there, Festus laid Paul's case before the king, saying, Well, there's a man who has been left as a prisoner by Felix, the previous procurator, and when I was at Jerusalem, the chief priests and the elders of the Jews brought charges against him, asking for a sentence of condemnation against him. I answered them that it's not the custom of Romans to just hand over a man before the accused meets his accusers face to face, has an opportunity to make a defense against the charges. So after they had assembled, I did not delay, but on the next day I took my seat on the tribunal and I ordered the man to be brought before me. He goes on, verse 18, But when the accusers stood up, they began bringing charges against him, not to such crimes as I was expecting. They simply wanted to point out some disagreements with him about their own religion. I love this. And about a dead man, Jesus, whom Paul asserted was alive. I don't get it. You know, what's going on here? This guy was executed by the Romans. I know he died. Now Paul says he's alive. These guys say he's not. I don't know. You know, but why do we care? We're Romans. You know, we don't care about these things. But he's trying to figure all this out, and so he's telling King Agrippa II all about these details. Going on verse 20. Being at a loss how to investigate such matters, I asked whether he was willing to go to Jerusalem and there to stand trial on these matters. But when Paul appeared to be held in, uh, appealed to be held in custody for the emperor's decision, I appealed to Caesar, I ordered him to be kept in custody until I sent him to Caesar. And then Agrippa said to Festus, I also would like to hear the man myself. Tomorrow, he said, you shall hear him. And so they set up this time for them to get together. So again, this King Agrippa II is interested in hearing more from Paul. Turn over to chapter 26, verse 1. Agrippa then, as the next day comes and Paul is there, Agrippa said to Paul, you are permitted to speak for yourself. And notice what Paul says here. Then Paul stretches out his hand and proceeds to make his defense. So it's a sign of honor. In regard to all the things of which I am accused by the Jews, I consider myself fortunate, King Agrippa, that I am able to make my defense, be defense before you today, especially because you are an expert in all customs and questions among the Jews. Therefore, I beg you to listen to me patiently. Jump all the way down to verse 24. 24 of chapter 26. While Paul was saying this in his defense, again, talking about the resurrection of Christ, Festus, the Roman, said to him in a loud voice, Paul, you are out of your mind. Your great learning is driving you mad. But Paul said to him, I am not out of my mind, most excellent Festus, but I utter words of sober truth. For the king here, Agrippa, Agrippa II, knows about these matters, and I speak to him also with confidence, since I am persuaded that none of these things have escaped his notice, for this has not been done in a corner. King Agrippa, do you believe the prophets? I know that you do. Agrippa replied to Paul, 
in a short time you will persuade me to become a Christian? You know, do, do you think you convince me this quickly? And Paul goes on and urges him, I, I hope you do. I hope you become a follower of Christ. Again, we don't know that that actually ever really happened. But this is the family line of the Herods. I thought it would be worthwhile to go through that very briefly so that you're just not confused about which Herod we're talking about at all during these times. A couple things just to bring to your attention about this family tree. This is not just a history lesson. Have you ever wondered why are some events preserved for us in the Scripture when so many other stories are not? I am confident that every story has a purpose. There's something there for us to understand and to learn. It's fascinating to me that these Herods, from Herod the Great to his four sons, to his grandson and great-grandson, these Herods had the privilege of being involved in the most important events in human history. Imagine your family being blessed for decades to be intimately involved in the things that God is doing and yet to miss it all. To not see any of it. To not believe in any of it. They rejected the truth that was before them. And for all eternity, this family bears the consequence of having been so close to truth but not believing it. Yes. You know, it is horribly sad that for generations this family was so close. And all, all you need to do is believe the truth. You, you, you have it right there. But are you going to act on it? Are you going to do it? Kelly. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I do think, from a human perspective, that when you have generations who are close to the truth but don't buy into it, that teaches the other generations to follow. That it's okay to get close to the truth, to dabble a little bit with truth, but you don't have to take it real seriously. My yes. Yeah, Pilate's declaration. This man is innocent, but I'm still going to kill him. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, you know, the, the New Testament reminds us, and it gives us these warning passages all the time, that when you see truth in front of you, grab hold of it. Uh, and my friends, I want to encourage you as parents, your children are watching. Demonstrate to them faith. Demonstrate to them confidence that what God says, I believe. And therefore, I'm going to act on those things. Give them good examples then of following by faith simply because it's what God says. We're going to do it. That, that, that's what faith is all about. You lead by example so that your children can understand those same things. Because if you're not careful, you see generations where they're faced with truth and walk away. Truth and walk away. Truth and walk away. And obviously, that's not what we want to do. Well, Let's get back on then to uh, what we're looking at in specifics today. So back to Acts chapter 12, if you would, please. And we'll wrap up chapter 12 with this situation with Herod. 
Again, we left off that uh, Peter had been imprisoned, but now he'd been miraculously relieved of all of that. He'd been escort, uh, escorted out of the prison, but what takes place after that? Well, Acts chapter 12, follow again, picking up in verse 18 of Acts chapter 12, verse 18. Now when day came, and there was no small disturbance among the soldiers as to what could have happened be, uh, or become of Peter, then Herod, uh, oh, when Herod had searched for him and had not found him, he examined the guards and ordered that they be led away to execution. And then he went down from Judea to Samaria and was spending time there. I always love the way that, uh, especially Luke sometimes in the Scripture writes things uh, there in verse 18. Uh, you know, later on in the morning, obviously all the soldiers at some point in time come out of their whatever, stoop or whatever it is that the Lord had put them in to allow Peter just to simply walk out and none of them notice. All of a sudden, they come to their senses and it's like, well, where, where's the guy? I mean, and the door's locked and guards, open the door. Who came out? Nobody came out. What are you talking about? He's not here. I mean, nobody knows what happened to this guy. He just disappeared as far as they were concerned. And as Luke says here, there was no small disturbance because of it. <laughs> the whole place was in an uproar, trying to figure out what now had happened to Peter. Again, remember we were told earlier there were four squads of soldiers guarding him. Depending upon how large these squads might have been, anywhere from, I'm guessing, at least three to five each in a squad, you had between 12 and 20 guards who are now held responsible for losing their prisoner. Each of them is executed because of this. And it's a reminder to me that there are consequences in this life. I mean, I'm excited as a believer that Peter's rescued. This is great. It led to the direct execution of between 12 and 20 men who were simply just doing their jobs as soldiers. You know, maybe they were good soldiers and decent guys who were just kind of doing their job. But there's consequences sometimes to the events of life. And we see that take place here. And then Herod just goes on to do what Herod does. You know, so Herod, again, uh, being the, the king in this particular area, oftentimes was in Jerusalem. But Caesarea really is the Romanish town that was built specifically for the Romans to enjoy Roman life in Palestine. So that's where they would always like to go back to when they could, back to Caesarea, and that really is kind of where the, 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 the capital of the Roman province is for this. Well, it goes on verses 22 or 20 to 23 to finish up this chapter almost. Verse 20, Now he, Herod, was very angry with the people of Tyre. Actually, let me switch over to the ESV version. He was very angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and with one accord they came to him. And having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they were asking for peace because their country was fed by the king's country. Now on an appointed day, Herod, having put on his royal apparel, took his seat on the rostrum, and he began delivering an address to them. And the people kept crying out, Ooh, the voice of a god and not of a man. And immediately an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. Really gross. Thank you. <laughs> and again, I'm sure there would be some modern explanation that we could understand if we would see this, but you also see the divine hand of God doing it and working through him here. Well, we're told again, now we get a little bit of geography, so that's why we're looking at maps again. So here we are in Caesarea, and it's the people of Tyre and Sidon up in Phoenicia <clears throat> that he's having this conflict with. Um, and so this is Lebanon today, by the way, and these, uh, these uh, you know, ancient cities still exist there in that geographic area. And they're having this conflict now with Herod back in Caesarea. They make a deal with Herod, evidently, because it says they talk about having won over Blastus, the king's chamberlain. So whatever this conflict was they were having, they do what politicians do. They get together, they negotiate, and then whatever really works out well for the king, 
he's going to be happy with, and so there's some kind of a political compromise that's put together with the man of power. And this is all about Herod's power and authority in this situation. Herod then comes out on the rostrum. You know, it's always an elevated seat bef- above the crowds. And in fact, and not necessarily from a preaching standpoint, but I mean, even politically speaking, you go into most city halls, you go into a, a, a lot of other areas, you know, the main speaker is raised up. I mean, that, that, that's from our Roman and Greek heritage of having those elected leaders higher above than where the rest of the individuals are. Herod takes his seat. He begins to speak to them, and this lavish praise is given to him. In fact, verse 22 specifically says, They cry out to him, Oh, it's the voice of a God and not a man. Now, as a man who has people say that to him, if you had somebody say that to you, you should simply acknowledge, No, 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 that's not the case. Oh, come on, folks. You know, I mean, even if you just sloughed it off a little bit. But, but he doesn't do even any of that. He just takes it for what it is. You know what? Don't mess with God's glory. He's very jealous of his glory. And we see what happens here with Herod. Immediately, an angel of the Lord struck him because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and died. You know, it it seems sudden. It may have been a condition that had been going on for a while. The timing was the Lord's that this was the time when you're not giving God the glory that everything's going to fall apart and uh, leads quickly to his untimely death. In a sense, I'm saddened to say that many of us probably deserve the same quick judgment from God at times. Maybe not claiming to be the voice of God, but I thank God that he's a gracious God, he's a merciful God with us, and that he doesn't unleash his judgment the instant it's deserved, because I deserve a lot of God's wrath. You deserve a lot of God's wrath, other than the mercy and the grace of Christ. It's the only thing that sustains us. What a contrast we see here with Herod and what follows. Look at verse 24 and 25. But the word of the Lord continued to grow and be multiplied. And Barnabas and Saul, returning from Jerusalem when they had fulfilled their mission, taking along with them John, who was also called Mark. It's just a historic narrative about what goes on. But again, nothing's written without a purpose. What a contrast. Herod, the king, the one with power, and authority dies early, agonizingly. But, verse 24, the word of the Lord continues to grow and be multiplied. Who's in charge? God's in charge. God's accomplishing his purposes. Even today, you pick up the newspaper, you turn on the TV, you uh, go listen to a podcast, you know, whatever you do to go get some information, and you hear about all the weird, wacky things that are going on in the world. And there's a lot of weird, wacky things going on in the world. God's in control. God is still perfectly, perfectly in control. Everything according to His will and His plan. And then we see a very simple statement there in verse 25. Practically speaking, oh yeah, Barnabas and Saul returned from Jerusalem. So again, we'd mentioned earlier they had been in Antioch, ministry was going great, they heard about this famine in Jerusalem, they sent money down here, you know, we have all this intervening stuff about what Herod's going on. Oh, by the way, they got done with their job and they went home. Okay, seems like just a very normal, matter-of-the-fact thing. The Lord is accomplishing His purposes because he's bringing them back for a purpose that they don't even know about. Now again, I think the goal of their lives would be, I want to be pleasing to the Lord. I want to serve the Lord. I want to do whatever the Lord wants me to do. I have no idea, though, the precise details of what that might be tomorrow, or the next month, the next year. But the Lord does. And the Lord is graciously moving his chess pieces around, just as he does today. 
He has you here today because he wants you here today. Tomorrow, I don't know where he's going to take you, what he's going to do with us, but he's going to accomplish his purpose as he moves these chess pieces around and he has them ready. And in fact, then, end of verse 25, one of the chess pieces is somebody goes along with them now. It was Barnabas and Saul who came down. Barnabas, Saul, and another one go back, John, who is also called Mark. He's going to play an important role in the ministry coming up. I believe this is also the same Mark that's mentioned in other places. Just write this down. I'm sure we'll talk more about it in the days to come. Colossians chapter 4, verse 10 says, as Paul is listing a whole series of people that he would like to have come visit him and see him, also he mentions Barnabas's cousin, Mark. Barnabas's cousin, Mark. Church history says this is the same Mark who eventually writes the Gospel of Mark. Church history says, again, this is the cousin of Barnabas, and we're going to see Barnabas play a critical role in his life, and Mark play a critical role in Barnabas' decisions on what he does with Saul, who be eventually becomes known more as Paul. But again, God is moving all of these pieces according to his good purposes. Wrapping it up then this morning, verses 1 to 3 of chapter 13. Now there were at Antioch, in the church that was there, prophets and teachers, Barnabas and Simeon, who's called Niger, Lucian of Cyrene, Menaean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. And so again, just names that are listed for us, but one of the things you'll notice is, number one, they're not all good Jewish boy names. Uh, these are m many of them kind of Gentile names from Gentile lands, and it mentions several of the other areas that they're from, from Cyprus, and again, from Cyrene, all of these individuals now, as we've been told earlier, are in Antioch. It's a very mixed kind of group that's there of Gentiles and Jewish believers and oftentimes Jewish believers from Gentile lands. And they're all there. And this church is incredibly blessed. They have gifted prophets and prophets primarily were those who would receive revelation from God and speak it forth. And they had gifted teachers, teachers who could explain the word of God to the people. This church was blessed with these leaders. And we see in verse 2, While they were ministering to the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work for which I have called them, or the work to which I have called them. The Holy Spirit now leads His church and speaks to His leadership as they're serving, as they're fasting. And again, fasting is one of those fascinating things to study more in the scripture. Uh, it's, it's a time to devote yourself to spiritual things. Deny yourself for a limited period of time, earthly pleasures, earthly needs, so that you can focus on spiritual purposes. These men are doing that, and the Spirit speaks to them now with all of these great gifted leaders in the church and says, I want you to set apart now Barnabas and Saul for this work that I have called them to go do. And no specifics are given here. He's just set them aside, and he's going to send them out for this work. And then we see verse 3. And when they had fasted and prayed and laid their hands on them, they sent them away. Again, they fasted. They, again, devoted themselves, set them apart from normal daily activities. They prayed earnestly for them, for the blessing of God, and then ultimately they laid their hands on them. It's a, it's a commissioning thing. It's not a power thing. There's not a transfer of power through the hands. It's a commissioning now that we are all together to go with you, and we are commissioning you. Oftentimes we even do this with elders and others who are being sent out today to commission them and to show our our uh, unity with them, and then they are sent away. And we'll see the details of who is actually going, but it mentions again Barnabas and Saul, and John Mark is going to want to go with them. Because it makes sense that little cousin wants to come along to learn about ministry, to see how this happens, and to go with them. And we'll see all of those great details coming up more next week.
Time's out. Let me pray. We can talk afterwards if you want. Father God, we just thank you again for your goodness and grace. Thank you for the chance to be in your word this morning. Thank you for uh, the encouragement that we see, uh, fr receive from this particular passage, that you are in control of your church. You continue to bless your church. You gift your church in the ways that we need it at a specific time and a specific place. You move your pieces around to accomplish your great purposes. So we praise you for that. We thank you for that. We simply ask that we would be faithful, that we would be hardworking, devoted to you, devoted to your word, and that you might see fit to bless us so that the gospel will go forth and that many, many other people will hear the truth of what Jesus has done and put their hope and trust in him. It's in his name we pray.